And now a prayer for listening hearts and minds. Holy God, pour out your spirit on us as we embrace your word. May you inspire us anew as we seek to follow in Christ's way. Amen. Our first scripture reading this morning is Romans chapter 8, verses 26 through 39. Let us listen carefully for God's wisdom and leading as the Apostle Paul writes to earlier follow, early followers of Christ in Rome, offering them encouragement. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He, did, he who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ, our Lord. And let us now turn in the New Testament to a gospel reading from the gospel according to St. Matthew. This is Matthew chapter 13, beginning with verse 31. Jesus put before them another parable, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all the seeds. But when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which someone found and hid, then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. And again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, and put the good into baskets, but threw out the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all this? Jesus asked. 
they answered, yes. May God grant understanding to our hearts and minds this reading from God's holy word. Let us pray. Dear God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts today be acceptable to you. For Lord, you are our rock, our strength, and our redeemer. Amen. Well, good morning. It is good to be with you all today. Uh, this is the second time that I've been invited to preach here today, so I express some gratitude for uh, Pastor Kendra and the session for this invitation. And for the record, I was here plenty early this time, so if you're keeping track, I'm one for two. So it is good to be here for all of worship this morning, for the lovely music and for uh, the gift of being here with you today. And, you know, I can never quite take off that stated clerk hat as well. So I say welcome on behalf of the Presbytery of the Twin Cities area. It is good to be in ministry together with you and to worship with you and to hear some stories about mission trips and, and the things that you all are doing to make a difference in uh, the world around you and to bring God's kingdom uh, nearby. Orange cars. Orange cars. So I had a high school speech coach that said you should always start with something memorable and interesting that would keep folks' attention. So today I'm starting with orange cars. And you're going to have to hold on to that thought before I get back to it. What I want to begin thinking about today is rivalries. Rivalries, how uh, natural it is for us to have a rival that we want a victory over. Before I moved to Minnesota 10 years ago or 15 years ago, almost now, I was in Hastings, Nebraska, the church that, uh, that Kinder Grams was baptized into, your pastor was baptized and confirmed into. I was an associate pastor there after she was already in college, but I knew a good deal about her and her family. So I lived in Hastings, Nebraska, and Hastings has Hastings High School, and then there's a county school called Adams Central. And even though those two schools were of different sizes, they were fierce rivals because you could opt into one or the other so the kids knew one another. There were generations of families that went to one school or the other. So it didn't matter what the record was. When Adams Central played Hastings High, everybody was there, and it was everybody's best game. You could be on the Hastings Tigers football team and have a completely losing season, but if you beat Adam Central at the end of the year, it would be worth it. <laughs> you would feel like you had succeeded. Rivals, there's something about feeling like you deserve a win over your rival, something you want so badly. I grew up in Nebraska, and you can, uh, don't talk to me about the current state of Nebraska football. Uh, but my dad had a t-shirt growing up saying my two favorite teams are the Nebraska Cornhuskers and whoever plays Oklahoma. <laughs> Meaning that it was okay even if your team didn't win as long as your rival lost. Right? You wanted to win over your rival. And sometimes, sometimes you had to wait for it. Now I know I'm a Minnesotan preaching in Wisconsin, so there's probably something to that Viking-Packer <laughs> rivalry as well, you know. It matters if you win that game at the end of the year. Well, today in Matthew's gospel, I think the people that are coming to listen to Jesus talk about God's kingdom are the people who are wanting a win. They've been waiting so long to beat their rivals. Now, they're, they're folks that have been paying attention to the Old Testament and the promise of the prophets to say that God will bring a Messiah. And so they believe it when Jesus says, I am the Messiah. And so they follow Jesus because the Messiah is going to grant them a victory. The Messiah will come with strength. The Messiah will come and sit on a throne. And above all, the Messiah will come to put their arch rivals down. You know, the people of Israel kind of had it from all sides with Pharaoh and with Rome and with Babylon. And they were waiting for a win. And so here is Jesus the Messiah, and it's time for a win. And so when Jesus says the kingdom of God is like, I can imagine that they had that sentence finished in their head already, right? The kingdom of God is like a vanquished army that will come and give us a win. The kingdom of God is like strength and might and power that will deliver and save us. And yet that's not what Jesus says. 
Jesus doesn't talk about the kingdom of God like it's a win, like it's an us versus them. No, Jesus talks about things like seeds or yeast or pearls or nets. You can almost hear the crowd sigh in exasperation. What kind of Messiah is this? And I love at the end, right? Jesus says, have you understood this? And what's recorded, the disciples say, yes, <laughs> but I'm not so sure. <laughs> Jesus says the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed, right? The tiniest of seeds. If you've ever held one, it can get lost in your palm. It is a tiny, tiny seed. And if you've ever planted anything, right, you know that there's only so much you can control. You can make sure the moisture is good, the soil is good and fertilized. You can make sure it's outside and gets sun when it comes. You can control the water, but you can't control the timing of that seed, right? There's something innate about what God has made that will grow when the time is right. And so Jesus says the kingdom of God is like that, this tiny mustard seed that comes slowly but when it does come, it provides home for the birds of the air. It provides shelter for God's critters. So maybe the kingdom of God is like that, something that comes among us slowly and yet makes a difference. I had the privilege of going on a servant's mission and learning trip with a congregation uh, in Plainview. Uh, this summer, I have a high school kid, so I was able to be an adult sponsor, and we went to Duluth to work with some agencies there. And one of the agencies we work with is a, an apartment complex that, that practices the housing first policy, meaning that they believe that before anyone can solve any of their other problems, they need stable housing. So they let everybody in. I mean, they have this incredibly generous sliding scale from no rent to very little rent. And so they'll take anybody if you're, uh, you don't have to be sober or you can still be addicted, you can still have all sorts of problems and they'll house you first because they believe that's the first step. And then they have a whole bunch of workers and social workers and uh, support agencies to help them with that next step. But housing first. So you can imagine that it's a little chaotic, right, as they are moving families in. And so we helped sort a donation closet that was huge and just so overwhelmed. But as we were finishing, we saw a family come in to pick up the basic needs for their apartment. I imagine that's what the kingdom of God is like a little bit chaotic, a little bit out of control, and yet offering hope in the midst of it. It's rather different than those that think the kingdom of God is that might makes right. You know, Jesus doesn't say that the kingdom of God is like those with the biggest army or the more tanks will win. Jesus says the kingdom of God is like a woman making bread. Now in Jesus' time when this gospel was written, women had very little power, very little authority. And yet this woman doing her daily chores, doing what she can in her kitchen, uses that little yeast to leaven the bread and then shares it with her community. Someone who has very little power or authority, yet blessing those around her. That's what the kingdom of heaven is like, using what we have in the face of great odds to make a difference. Jesus does not say the kingdom of God comes through the traditional halls of power where if we elect just the right official that thinks just like us, it will be okay. Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like bread. Jesus says the kingdom of God is like a great treasure buried that when found will make all of the difference in the world. Different than those who believe the kingdom of heaven is something scarce that we have to hold on to what is ours rather than share and give away. So what about you? What do you think the kingdom of heaven is like? Maybe it's showing up to worship on a Sunday morning in August instead of sleeping in or going to the river where there's much more fun things to do. Or maybe the kingdom of heaven is like giving what you have, the resources that you've been blessed, your time, your treasure, your talents to help others. For surely the kingdom of God is when we think beyond ourselves to bless those that need it. Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like a net that catches everything, right? And then they begin to sort out the good and the bad. For me, that means that we don't have to get everything figured out, right? God will gather us all in and it's up to God. The God will take care of the rest. A couple weeks ago, I heard my friend, Pastor Krista, share this story. Krista tells about a woman in her 80s who bakes oatmeal cookies twice a week and takes them to the local youth detention facility. 
when we hear that story, we think, oh, that's lovely, right? It's so nice that this um, older person can occupy herself by baking cookies for others. That's a, a charming story. But then you hear from the superintendent of the facility who says, these cookies are magic. They've transformed the whole facility. You see the young men here who are incarcerated, many of them have never been given anything in their entire life. Many of them have never had a meal or something baked for them. And so he says that when that woman comes to bring her cookies, that they stand at the bars of their cells like children on Christmas morning, eager to receive a gift. He says these cookies have changed them. I will never look at an oatmeal cookie the same way when it has the power to bless and change lives. That's what I think Jesus says the kingdom of God looks like. And the good news for us is that you and I get to be part of that coming kingdom. You see, we don't have to be the strongest in the room or the most intelligent in the room or the most charming in the room. We don't have to be good enough or powerful enough. We just have to be. Be beloved by God. Be God's children. And God will use you and I to be vehicles of bringing God's kingdom into this world. Because I believe God's kingdom is here and comes closer every day when you and I lean into God's love and share God's grace. Which brings me back to orange cars. Now, you might not think there's very many orange cars in the world, but I guarantee you that when you leave this place today, and if you remember what this strange preacher from Minnesota said this morning, you'll pay attention and look for orange cars, and you'll start to see them because they're out there. And then maybe you'll remember that that's what God's kingdom is like as well. It's also out there. You just have to pay attention to see signs of the little things, the little measures that God uses to bring God's kingdom forth. And pay attention to that. And maybe even hear an invitation to lean into that. Amen.